Patrice O'Neill was a comedian like no other, and if you were lucky enough to see him live, you could tell that you were in the presence of someone special. I get like, uh, like you know, like fat people I don't know, like, uh, you know, fat strangers. They'll sp- they speak to me in the middle of the street like we got some sort of, you know, bond or something like, you know, hey, you know, hey, I eat too. I, I don't know you. But his comedy wasn't the only thing that made him memorable. In my opinion, it was his philosophy. From relationships to show business and even video games, Patrice had a unique insight on almost every little thing you could imagine, and his views often went against the status quo. You talk about a lot of things that a lot of people don't talk about. Well, that's why nobody knows me. That's why a lot of people thought I was a a woman. (laughs) No one thought that Patrice O'Neill was a woman. Watch this, man. It, how many people knew me before I came out here? One, two, three, yeah. seven. Seven? That's more than how seven many, people. How many, knew, how many thought Patrice O'Neill was a lovely white girl or an Irish? <laughs> someone thought it was Thank someone. Thank you for being honest. This, it is what it is. <laughs> well, that's kind of There's what it's guy all right about. There rubbing his face like, when are we going to see something else that, I, that <laughs> relates to me? This is what made his philosophy so special because it came from someone who wasn't afraid of opposing popular opinion and who wrote jokes that addressed the elephant in the room. Having women work with men, right, is like having a grizzly bear work with salmon. (laughs) Dipped in honey, like so. Now you dip the salmon in the honey, right? Grizzly bears. And the salmon get to walk through comfortable with honey and fish and good morning, grizzly bears. And the grizzly bears is like, hey, you can't even, you can't even growl like, ah, what's up, fish? Oh my God, human resources, the grizzly bear just did grizzly bears. So. But if you could boil down his philosophy into the fundamentals, what would be some of the principles? In an attempt to distill what Patrice O'Neill stood for and believed in, I want to cover some of his broader principles of his philosophy because the ideas and wisdoms that he imparted are something that demand attention and expansion upon because each viewpoint Patrice shared wasn't made up fleetingly or without purpose. There was reasoning, logic, insight. But your your world is not funny. Your world is uh, next <laughs> next on the big story. <laughs> My world is people trying to be funny. Well, I mean, you you think it's okay to try to make jokes about rape? I'm diabetic. I make fun of that. I'm a victim. I might lose a toe, but I'm trying to make funny of. I'm trying to make fun of anything I I think I can make fun of. The largest of his viewpoints covered his thoughts on comedy, honesty, and relationships. And each has a deeper meaning to them that I've rarely seen from any other comedian. And it's within these three areas that I want to cover in this video because they made Patrice more than just a comedian. They made him an icon. How the f*** can I be too mean after all this shit? I can't believe it. I'm dying of diabetes and you motherfuckers are like, oh, that evil fat you know. The first staple of Patrice's philosophy is the idea that comedy is about having 50% of people laughing with the other 50% being horrified. I had to learn to stop caring about people not laughing because the the idea of comedy really is not everybody should be laughing. It should be about 50 people laughing and 50 people horrified. (laughs) You know what I mean? It's supposed to be people that get it and people that don't get it. As Patrice describes, comedy for him wasn't just about making people laugh. It was also about doing the exact opposite. And this suggests why he often wanted to address the elephant in the room with his own jokes, even if it meant polarizing the audience. Were you not hopeful that there would be change with Obama in office? We love magic, man. We don't like talking reality. That's why I never really fell for the whole thing. Mm -hmm. We like, that's why people think ancient dishwashers have predicted the end of the world in 2012, man. I don't believe in that. (laughs) Ancient dishwashers. The apocalypto goofy little short dude. I don't, I don't believe in it. (laughs) You feel this though? You feel this. It's just like, ooh, because I said ancient dishwashers. But let's be honest, that's some funny shit. But it, it, (laughs) 
But why would a comedian actually want to horrify the same people who would pay to come and see him? In my opinion, what Patrice meant by this principle is that he genuinely believed comedy should be used as a tool to explore topics that were off the table and that it might actually be one of the best ways to do so. Because as Patrice often did, he could then tackle serious subjects in a light-hearted manner. You ever feel like a terrible person when you're watching the news? Like, like you're watching the news and no matter what's on, you just, you just can't, you can't care like you try to, but it just... 30,000 Chinese people died in an earthquake. And you're like, oh my God. Uh, oh, wow. I could care less. Oh my God. I feel that Patrice knew that if comedy was simply about pleasing the audience all the time, it would mean not every topic could be covered because not everything would make people laugh. Here's my question. How can you justify a bad joke, a joke that isn't funny? Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Go ahead. An attempt that isn't funny, doesn't get any laughs, and is about raping a, the first black woman to ever become the Secretary of State well, of the United States. Throw that at me. Well, why the, not? The, the attempt is what I'm trying to fight for. The joke may or may... Funny jokes and unfunny jokes are, are come out of the same birth that you you don't know if anything is going to be funny you should attempt don't to be you, able to make anything don't you funny think a joke about rape is doomed to be not funny it's possible but i've heard them i've heard you've them. heard a funny rape joke uh, i say a couple watch my hbo special i'm pretty good at it <laughs> some content is always going to be controversial or dangerous to talk about simply because to people it's no laughing matter so how could you bring it up without offending someone in the first place, let alone making a joke about it. He was he trying said to say a violent act of hitting her in the back of her head, her body. It's called the donkey up, punch. Which will then. Why are you laughing? She's outraged. It's called the donkey punch. It's whole humor that she has no she clue has what it is. The same problem that Opie and Anthony does. You can't say just anything on the air. You can say anything you want. It might not be funny. You might get in trouble for it, but you should be able to be attempting. And plus, when is a crazy bum going to get an opportunity to rape the president? If the, the president's wife, John? To me, Patrice didn't care about this. He didn't care if someone took offense or hated him for daring to bring it up in the first place. She has an entire encyclopedia of, of her stance on it, but it's no passion involved. It's not a real, this is just what she has to say. We are outraged and oh, fired and fired an and fired. Name calling. I'm he's outraged. I am I'm, outraged. You should, be. you should be outraged. I am a fool. Patrice always dared to address the elephant in the room because he wanted to truly have his freedom to discuss anything on his mind, which was in turn something that he wanted for everyone. It just sets people up who want to control everyone, right? Where you go, okay, Tracy, you go, a guy like Tracy, he isn't qualified to have an opinion. This having an opinion, it should be in the hands of people who are qualified intellectually. <laughs> So guys like him, if he's not, if he don't have a, a degree, if you don't, they, they'll yeah. start making language elite where you can't, you can't have an opinion. But I say Tracy can be as ignorant, as fucked up as he wants to be yeah, because I want to be able to communicate. And if I'm fucked up, let me be fucked up. But I support anything as long as you're not hitting me and robbing me right. for patrice talking about things in this manner was different to physical violence which is why he didn't mind risking the chance of upsetting someone even if they would label it as hate speech in fact this was something that he embraced this is my question for life Mm. What, what, now, can we say, are we retiring the phrase sticks and stones and break my bones and names will never hurt? Is that now it seems, officially? Uh, it seems like we are. I think can you're no right. One, can no like one are. be, can, is, it, is it legal for me to say I endorse hate speech? I don't give a fuck. Yeah. I, I, I want I, hate speech. Yes. Like, why can't I hate you in speech? Exactly. 
His words might sound inflammatory, but in my view, what Patrice is alluding to is that he wanted the ability to simply voice his opinions, even if they were ones of opposition. His advocation of hate speech didn't mean he would actively seek out an opportunity to be hostile or unfriendly to someone, but it did mean he was able to tell someone he didn't like them if that was something he truly felt. Legislating feelings is... I don't want white people to like me if they don't mm. like don't force them don't force the, I, <laughs> don't force don't don't make white people like me Patrice didn't want us to be afraid of talking because by engaging in a discussion, we could actually better ourselves as people who embrace the truth no matter how hard it was to talk about. You, none of you know what funny is. Like yeah. a doc, the doctor. Was that fun, uh, was, was, it, was it funny what I was funny to me? Nappy headed. Was it funny? Was it funny? Is hilarious. But in 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 what, context that's tragic, of hold on, hold in on. context of a comic. You should be able to explore any words you want to say. He right. messed up. Would it be different if a black person said it? Of course. I could say nappy headed hoe all day. <laughs> yeah, but right. I want to be able to call white girls straight headed hoes anytime I feel like. Right. I, anytime. And would you? Of course. And would you should be should you be punished for it? Of course not. Right. So Dr. This is what he stood for, and it's why he loved talking about any subject, even if others didn't want him to. That, to me, is what was special about his comedy, as it became a pillar about who he was as a person. I'm just saying, I'm just saying, I'm just saying I, I, no. I know funny. And I know <laughs> if he had said nappy-headed athletes, that would nappy-headed that okay? young women. You why go, is that okay? Why is... No, it's not okay if he had said We'd that. Be just as Nappy-headed athlete would have been... Is he using an adjective? To, a, 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 I don't get that. Yeah. But to say nappy-headed hoe is so ridiculous, you yeah. know he was trying to be funny. Well, you that's know it. it. His lack of political correctness and advocacy for speaking his mind, especially when it came to calling out things that didn't feel right to him, was what made him an icon for addressing the elephant in the room. And I genuinely feel that in doing so, Patrice was able to actually do more good than harm. I like saying nigga. I, I, I want to use so it. Do I. Exactly. So it's not. And this is this is the thing. I love the motherfucking word, right? And not because I love to say call anybody a nigga. I call white women nigga. It's just, I like that word. Why do you like that word? Can I ask? Because black people ain't getting no money for slavery. We ain't gonna, we ain't gonna get reparations. What we did have is language. We got to say anything we want, the way we want, which is the reparations, which is the fact that I can say cracker all day and everybody goes, uh -huh, uh -huh. but <laughs> because that was my payoff as a black man, I get to say what the fuck I want to white people anytime I want. So in allowing an open forum to discuss controversial ideas or opinions that in turn actually got to the heart of the matter and sought out the truth, Patrice encouraged intelligent discourse by asking questions or stating viewpoints that many people might also be thinking of, or at least which were interesting to hear, but that were also risky to bring up from fear of embarrassment, or more often than not, offending someone. You know, I, there's, there's one, it's, it's, it's harassment day. I think we, men and women should discuss harassment and, and whether or not it's, it's, it's as bad as it... You know, it's, it's, I mean, there's some women that would love to be harassed and I'm not talking about grad, but just like, hey, cutie pie, you're looking good. Uh, yeah. And uh, maybe I can date you or something. It's, it's, it, I discuss that. Yeah, that's I discuss uh, <laughs> Natalie Holloway. Won't get into that because there's plenty of Natalie Holloway's here tonight. I, I'm not going to get into that. <laughs> um, do you see? But this is you see this reaction. This is why no one knows me because because. <laughs> Because white people go, ew, you, listen. <laughs> By daring to go where no one would go, Patrice showed us that it was possible to find a way to make any topic okay to talk about. And also how it could be funny, even if not everyone was laughing. Listen, <laughs> he, he said a joke earlier that I, I it, was a, it was a great joke about uh, black people getting treated better, about the, the dog, what, what's Mr. Dog? Don't lie to yourselves. Did you feel how uncomfortable you were? <laughs> White people, all this is your fault. It ain't my fault. <laughs> Patrice had the foresight to see that although he'd come across as a monster to some initially, in time, people would realize that he was just ahead of the curve and that he'd be respected for saying it how it is. 
But I felt the feeling of, of trying to make it and that, that vague make it, that, right. that emptiness of I've made it. What's it? You know what I'm saying? So I don't, I just do it because when a guy t- says to me, dude, you know, man, that ch- I, you changed my life. That feels good. If a dude says you changed my life or a woman says you changed my life for some goofy shit you did, you know, that means something. That's it. The second staple of Patrice's philosophy can be summarized broadly as aim to be righteous, but be careful of what you owe. And let's break down these two ideas that although seem to be opposite, are in actuality two sides of the same coin. Firstly, to aim to be righteous. This was something Patrice wanted to do throughout the course of his life, and he referred to it as a guiding principle. What I'm trying to do is be righteous. And when I say righteous, I don't mean God you know, God righteous. I mean, just when I wake up, I know I was honest to myself. You know what I mean? Being righteous wasn't about being religious, but rather being honest with what he wanted in life and about being true to himself no matter what. That's why I'm like I am, because I, I wish I could just be funny and it all be fun, but it's not. The business part of it, I'm, I'm, I don't excel at the business part of it. Because the business part always lends itself to a lot of things that you just don't want to do like if i want to be a curmudgeon i want to be you know as long as i'm not hurting anybody right like i could be the grinch as long as i'm not trying to fucking steal your christmas you know what i'm saying (laughs) for me his comedy was an extension of this belief and it touches on the elements mentioned before about how patrice wanted to be able to express his mind freely on any topic it's like can we talk about it without you saying i'm a fucking i'm a anti this and a fucking that man stop it's 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 scary. It's it's deflating. It's it's it, it makes it makes me furious, man. It makes me furious because you feel lonely and help. You feel helpless because mm. you know you have to deal with this shit to make it in this business. And I got in this business because I was a funny kid. Mm-hmm. And then I found out what comedy was, and it ain't funny. <laughs> and I'm like, it, it tricked me. His desire to have true freedom of speech was an extension of his desire to be righteous to himself because it was something he truly felt passionate about to his core. If, if this is how Imus is going to be treated, what about the people leading the charge? Is it fair? You say, well, you're trying to create that, this. Is, is there hypocrisy? The, divide and conquer. No. That's why. To, I'm not to, dividing and conquer. I'm saying no, Sean, to, pre- to Sean, prevent Sean, Sean, it from being that, that let him say what he wants so I can say what I want. everybody to say everything. You don't care. Yes. All right, but that's, that's, you're more, you're being, you know, real and honest. But I'm saying, are they being hypocritical? And sexist. Are they being no. hypocritical? Hang on a second. Hip- this ability to say what was on his mind, despite any consequences, was something he advocated and that was part of who he was as a person. I do want to be able to say something against the status quo without losing everything I have. Without losing everything I have. But such a thing is a challenge in and of itself, and especially so in an industry such as show business, where everything you say is constantly looked upon under a microscope. And although Patrice spoke of this challenge and the emerging culture surrounding silencing anyone who spoke out against the status quo years ahead before even such a term as cancel culture was ever coined, Patrice again had the foresight and wisdom to recognize why it went against his values and how it had impacted his career thus far. It's something else. It's cartel. It's somebody owing somebody the favor. I was close. I was I was hooked in with the Spike Lee cartel. He had his own baby cartel that he's connected, but you can be he's big enough for you to be connected to him, <laughs> but he's connected to somebody else. And and he asked me for a favor, and I said I can't. Gone off with the head. It's clear that because of his desire to stay righteous to himself and to resist the pressures of show business, not all of the opportunities that could have been afforded to Patrice were given to him. Obviously. This business is the beast yeah. and it eats everybody and shits them out but here's what's funny about the beast it's a never-ending line of people who want to get in the mouth and get <laughs> chewed up and shit out why is that it's because you, when you get in the belly yeah. you get two million dollars a week <laughs> and when you get shit out you, you're a pile back there and you have the you have the option 
to go get back in line and wait <laughs> to go get back in the beast and get eaten and it's shit out. Fucker is and we line hilarious. up. But despite all of this, I genuinely don't believe that Patrice ever compromised himself or his integrity in order to stay relevant in show business. That's why I talk so much because. I want people to understand what I'm saying. Now, if I talk about gays and talk about anything I have a problem with, I'm going to make sure if they're going to end my career, you know that it's, it's, a, it's a muscle move, that it's unfair. To me, he was battling those who wanted him to conform or be a different version of himself because he knew deep down that he wasn't being righteous by doing so. He goes, man, I got this role I want, want you to do, but can you not be you? but be you. Hmm. I go, what are you, fu I knew what he meant, but I wanted him to say it. So you're saying, you think that you can get everything good out of me without getting no bad. <laughs> the reason you think I'm good is because of the bad part. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's an entirety. In my view, this is why he wasn't afraid of risking it all in terms of his career, because at the end of the day, he wanted to be able to wake up and look in the mirror to see a man who was honest with what he wanted and with who he was as not just a comedian, but also as a human being. If, if, you're, if you're kind of forced or, or urged to kind of lift yourself up a, l a little that's, bit. That's the, that, but that's, that's you just reading from whatever. That's, what you just said is in some book <laughs> somewhere. That somebody, I barely read, so that, I don't, I don't it's know. Gotta, you got to write your own books, man. It's like, What's the word? It's like I learned one of the few things I learned in college is good is good if it's good for me. Yeah. And I, I enjoy the people I enjoy. I enjoy things the way I enjoy it. I don't want to enjoy life uh, set up by someone else's rules of how to enjoy life, if, that, if that's what it means. This leads me to the second half of that expression in being careful with what you owe. As a person who worked in show business, Patrice realized that there were certain rules of the game that he had to understand in order to be successful when it came to working as not just a comedian, but any entertainer in Hollywood. These rules or ideas included recognizing that no person ruled alone, loyalty always came at a cost, and that you had to be aware of what it took in order to make it in the business. You couldn't be ignorant, otherwise you'd either fall behind or risk losing it all. Patrice discussed these elements by warning people of being careful of what they owed. I didn't lose fame, glory and everything. I only lost some, some money. Yeah. But you know, they got motherfuckers, you lose everything, but see, it's everything that you want. You want shine. You wanna, <laughs> you, I, I sat twice up on the front row M M MSG, my girl with me, with me, uh, twice, I think it's twice or once. It's so intoxicating when you're <laughs> in the front row. You're looking around at who else is there, right? You have to move your feet because you might trip the player. <laughs> <laughs> when they threaten to take that away, you get scared. This idea might sound like it applies to only those in show business, but what's interesting is that it expands upon all facets of life. As Patrice goes on to describe about how almost any career path or type of organization is really part of a bigger system that has rules and caveats that are important to understand if you'd like to be successful or at least understand the game of it all from the sidelines. Now you see the guy that got the promotion over mm -hmm. you, you know you're better, yep. but he was playing the fucking game he did simple as that he, he did what he, he had played to play those do. dumb things that you just don't want to do and and you're an idiot yeah did for you, not yeah. for so not doing game, it that right, way but right. you truly are an idiot because that's the game you're yeah, in you're fucked those up are the by rules not. To me, this idea can sound almost like a conspiracy theory as it suggests or hints that everything in life is run by an invisible set of guidelines and perhaps is known only by select members of a hidden society. But what I take from it is that it's really about understanding your role as a human being in any walk of life or career that you undertake and learning more so about what it takes to be successful in what you do in life, but moreover, not compromising your own set of values if it means getting ahead. Ultimately, this is what Patrice meant by not wanting to owe too much and why he warned to be careful of how much you owed as it was something that he learned early on in his career. That movie I did, um, The 25th Hour? Yeah. I didn't, I really didn't audition for that. He said, hey man, 
you a Celtics fan, ain't you? I said, yeah, man, I'm from Boston. He goes, all right, you got it. You got the dig. Like, he saw my comedy, <laughs> liked me, sat me down. Yeah. He said, you're in. He just, you're in. Put me in this movie. Was really nice to me. Uh, put me in voiceover commercials and all type of shit. I was seeing money I never seen before. <laughs> And he asked me, it was, uh, it was some, some gig with, uh, like Showtime. Something happened with Showtime. But they did me real dirty, but he was doing this show, this movie with Showtime. And I said, man, I said, I can do the part. I, I don't want to come read. But I did it through my agents. I did the right thing. Uh huh. He just bypassed my agents, everybody else. He called me personally and said, come, come do this. And I go, well, I, how can I, what am I gonna do? Just say, fuck my agents and fuck people. That I, I have a business with, if I do that, that destroys my entire system. I yeah. feel like I should have a system like you have a system. I, I can't. He said, I, that was it. Patrice constantly struggled or fought against the unspoken rules of show business and is why he was always advocating for people to be careful of what they owed. He wanted us to understand what it really meant to owe something to another person or several persons who might oversee your success in life and who might hold something against you later on down the line. For the people who helped get you to where you are today but who might take something from you in the future. The potential consequences of owing too much. But I'm like, I don't want to put myself in a spot to where I'm balanced. Like I'm telling you, I, I sit, I sit in my house every day, and I, and I, I, I appreciate my ceiling fan, man. Because <laughs> one day somebody's gonna try to take it, and I gotta look <laughs> at it and know that someday somebody's gonna try to take my ceiling fan. There are those in life that you might see who follow the law of the land so well that their career progression up the ladder feels almost artificial and dishonest that it can be infuriating to watch them succeed while you continue to sit back on the sidelines without much progression. The same kind of people that you know are simply kissing ass and sucking up just to get ahead in life. This isn't what Patrice was trying to tell people to do, but he did want us to acknowledge it. He did want us to be aware of the rules of the game, but more importantly, why we shouldn't succumb to the temptations of getting ahead if it compromises our integrity, as he didn't want us to fall into a role in which we would become obligated to someone else, or worse yet, the vicious cycle of success itself. I've been, t I've tasted little parts of what success is. I've tasted it. It's it's it's, it's good. It's, it's deliciously. <laughs> you you get drunk off of it. Uh huh. But you know what I'm getting from you though is it's not a fear. That's too easy to say of 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 success. You don't want to put yourself in a position where you can fall hard and hurt yourself. And you and, owe. But you owe. For me, Patrice wanted us to avoid falling into this trap of just becoming a slave to your own career and pursuing a never-ending chase of attaining more and more achievements simply for the sake of collecting achievements, instead of pursuing what was truly meaningful. He wanted us to realize that by letting success blind us, we risk never feeling content with our lives as we constantly move the goalposts to achieve more and more, leading us to an increased amount of success that also increases our risk towards failure. Patrice refers to this as the day someone comes knocking at your door or the day in which you fail to jump over the hurdles on your way up the success ladder where you have to now pay back what you owe. It's not a fear. That's too easy to say of, of, of success. You don't want to put yourself in a position where you can fall hard and hurt yourself. And you and, owe. But you owe. And the Godfather, all luckily, what he owed was fix my son up. He yeah, got shot. Yeah. And you go, Ooh. but when you hear the knock on your door and he goes, I need you to do me a favor. <laughs> you're going to you're going to be at the. A dinner with the president, aren't you? Uh, yeah. Or I'm, you're going to be at a dinner with somebody I want dead. Right. I want you to put this pill in his drink. Oof. Uh, I, 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 I don't... Uh, well, see. Well, what you owe is we're going to kill your whole family. I told you. <laughs> oh, I want my favor. So you do that, and then just you'll get caught and maybe go to jail. But your wife and kids, we won't blow the whole house up. But you owe us. And that's why you're in, you're in my debt.
This is what Patrice was warning us about, and it's why he wanted always to be righteous with himself. For Patrice, he got into comedy because he was a funny kid, but he realized that when he did get in, comedy wasn't just about being funny, and that it was about something more. He realized that there were certain rules he had to abide by and be included in certain groups if he wanted to be successful in his own career. Okay, say I, I get a show on TV. Say it's not, it's not too popular. Mm-hmm. But they keep, they keep it on for me until it gets popular. A favor? I owe. I fucking owe. Patrice valued his own belief system, honest integrity, and set of principles far too much to give in to feeding the show business beast, and in the process, risk losing his sense of righteousness. He always wanted to be truthful to who he was, even if he was part of a bigger system. That's not an easy thing to do, but it's why Patrice, to me, was always bigger than just a comedian. He was an intelligent individual who knew to be true to himself no matter what, and to be careful of what he owed. My risk is opening my fucking mouth. It's risky. It's a risky thing. Yeah. So I'm not afraid of nothing. I just don't want to be at a party and somebody goes, Patrice, here, try this. What is it? It, It'll it'll make you feel better. I don't drink shit that makes me feel better, motherfucker. All right. Listen, um, the party's over for you. (laughs) (laughs) The party is over. The final cornerstone of Patrice O'Neill's philosophy was on a subject that, in my opinion, was one that he was most passionate about, relationships. I'm going to give you some advice, ladies, on how to keep your man liking you once he loves you, if that's possible. This is what I think. (laughs) Men want to be alone, (laughs) but we don't want to be by ourselves. Does that make sense at all? And although he spoke on length about this topic, I want to focus in on one sentence that to me summarizes most poignantly what Patrice embodied throughout all of his discussions on relationships, which says that a happy man means a happy woman. Yeah, I just want to say Patrice saved my marriage. I was the, uh, the doting, the doting husband and was always, it was all about her. Uh, started to listen to him and, Things were, were going bad, so I started going, well, what would Patrice do? I started following his advice. What would Patrice do? <laughs> it was bad at first, but it's turned her around, and we're happier than we could possibly ever be. WWPD shirts. Here's what he said. Here's what he said. Here's what he said. Here's, here's what he said. We're happy. Yeah. A happy man is a happy relationship. A yeah. happy woman is a miserable man. This idea sounds misleading upon initial glance, as if you were to simply look at the words on just a surface level, it can lead you to think that in a relationship, only men should be in focus, or that their happiness is the only thing important. To me, this isn't what Patrice was purely advocating for, as there's layers to what he really means. Yes, Patrice believed that men should own up to being slightly more dominant in a relationship, but what he adds is that he wants men to realize that women want their partners to take responsibility as a fully matured adult man who isn't going to let anyone walk over them. For Patrice, it was about getting your things in order. Patrice. Wow. She, she, you, wanted, she wanted me to be the man. That's, that's, that's the what the fucking the point out. is. It's a mind thing. All they want, all they want is just a motherfucker they can look at and blink slow and respect. And, and you know, it's not about beating them and, and, and subjugating them. It's about they look at you and feel like they don't need to be your mama. That's right. it. Patrice wanted men to get their lives in order so in turn their relationships would benefit. For Patrice... It was about being accountable. That they go, wow, this motherfucker is in my corner. He handles his business. You know how sexy... This is what I'm saying. Your house situation, you become a million times sexier. Because that's some man shit you did is buy a fucking mansion. That's some man shit. But although he suggests that men's happiness should come first or should triumph in priority to women, what Patrice also wants us to realize is that in order for a relationship between men and women to work, he doesn't want anyone to self-sacrifice or self-edit themselves when it comes to sharing how they really feel towards their partner, which often happens when we become too concerned with pleasing our partner and catering towards their needs even if they come at the expense of our own men have an editing system in the middle before it gets to our mouth and brain 
where we're always trying to make someone else feel better before we open our mouths. And I'm trying to cut that editing system out so that actually women can really truly understand what we want. Patrice believed that by large, a lot of self-editing came from the side of men, and in particular, men who always wanted to please women, no matter what the case, even if it went against their gut feelings. To me, this idea really works both ways, because we should never not express how we truly feel to each other, especially towards our partner who we care for, simply just because we want to please them or protect them from potentially feeling offended by what we have to say. Self-editing means self-sacrificing, and that's not beneficial to anyone in any form of relationship. In truth, it's through this process of not actually saying what's on our mind that really detracts from caring about someone because we're choosing not to be honest with them. We're choosing not to be open and honest with them because we have this notion that we really think we know what's best for them. We think that a simple white lie here and there is better to maintain the peace instead of embracing a short-term conflict that ultimately leads to a happier long-term resolution. The, the good part of this whole thing is that he chooses to be with her. He chooses to love her. Yeah. He's not obligated yes. to it. And the second he starts taking shit from her, that means that he is obligated to love her and yes. be with her. It means he lost the power. That mean, I, uh, I, uh, I volunteer my love to my girl. And if she takes that <laughs> shit for know. granted, then I, I take my free love away. <laughs> then I freely give her. This, in my opinion, is what Patrice really meant by a happy man means a happy woman. He observed too many men going against their gut instincts and caring almost too much for how their partner felt to the point where they didn't even want to risk offending them because of an opinion that may go against them. Here's where it ends for men. When that, when we get, you ever get that gut feeling of this fucking bitch, but you don't say nothing, okay? Where it ends is where you don't say nothing. Patrice hated this process of self-editing to the point where he wanted all men to realize that they should focus on making themselves happy first, despite whatever consequences came about as a result of them unediting themselves and actually expressing how they felt towards their partner. I read one thing where it says one, one to ten, the, the worst things to talk about during a date. Right, right, right. Don't talk about religion. Don't talk about... It, it, it's like... What is there to talk about? You're saying what you don't want to talk about. Again, this is for you. It's not for us. No, no, but you don't, you listen. That's the idea. These are shortcuts. Do you want to, do you want to shortcuts to what? Into her panties. These are the shortcuts. If you're going to start talking about Mm -hmm. religion, if you're going to talk, start talking about your mother, it's going to take you longer to get, if you're going to listen. But ultimately, there is no shortcuts. See, shortcuts to a woman's panties ends up being long cuts to my fucking life. (laughs) In turn, Therese wanted men to realize that if they actually removed this step of editing out their white knight-like behavior, it would instead improve their relationship with women. It would actually improve both their lives as it adds to the lives of their partners. Patrice knew that this was a win-win scenario as opposed to a lose-win situation in where only one person was happy, where only one person dictated the terms of the relationship. This isn't what Patrice wanted at all. Perfect example, I'm going to bed one time, my ex-girl, this is my Uh ex-girl, and she goes, what side of the bed do you want to lay on? Okay, this is the shit that, it, here's where it ends for men. When that, when we get, you ever get that gut feeling of this fucking bitch, but you don't say nothing, okay? Th- where it ends is where you don't say nothing. So she goes, what side of the bed do you want to lay on? And I go, this side. And then she goes, but then I won't be able to see the TV. And so I go, what well, bitch? Why the fuck did you ask me where you want to sleep anyway? Now, I could have went, okay, I'll just sleep on the other side. But that was some enabling shit that she wanted. Before I finish, I want to add that throughout expressing his views and opinions on relationships, Patrice does note that he himself does so in a way that is not necessarily the smoothest of methods. He explains that not everyone expresses themselves like him, even though they may have the same ideas and viewpoints he has on relationships. Patrice realizes that the way he articulates his points might not be the most palatable 
or the easiest on the ears, as he describes others around him, such as his good friend and radio co-host Dante Nero, as being a smoother individual than himself. You could be a smooth asshole. Yeah. I happen to not be a smooth asshole. <laughs> I think Jeffrey is a smooth but, asshole. But you're, Dante's but, a smooth <laughs> asshole. But that's why a lot of women, Jeffrey has been their favorite or Dante's been their favorite. You understand? Where you have a chick in your life for 10 years. I bring this up to address people who might hate Patrice to recognize that yes, despite what I genuinely feel about Patrice as a good-hearted individual with nothing but the best in mind for the people that he has met, he nevertheless wasn't the most articulate man in terms of expressing himself in a way that wasn't offensive or maybe in a way that he himself recognized was somewhat antiquated or outdated. The dilemma in my head is this. You back in the nineteen tens, <laughs> eight year old kids worked in the coal mine or whatever. <laughs> yeah. And God people back then thought that it that it uh built character. Yeah, yeah. But then we go up to our age where our parents hit us. And now we go, Oh, that, that built character when you hit it. So I'm saying the point I'm making is maybe I'm antiquated. Maybe I'm thinking old because I don't think kids should work in coal mines. Yeah. But I do think kids could should get hit. But now you can't even tease kids in school. It's, no. it's bully, bullying and bullying. Th- very important. So yeah. maybe it's right. Maybe the way the world's going is right. But at the same time, him not caring about offending people was the whole essence to Patrice's charm. And it's why I love him as a comedian, because he said things on his mind no matter whom he was talking to or how it may have sounded. He truly didn't care about offending someone, and that's what made him great. So even though he may not be the most smoothest of people to hear, Patrice was someone who told it how it was, or at the very least, how he saw it. The word brutal, honesty, I was I was thinking about that the other day. Like, the, the word brutal, honesty is just a dumb term. Like, I don't understand. Who wants their honesty? Like, brutal should be associated with lying. Okay. You're, little, you're a brutal liar. Right. As opposed to somebody that just is going to inform you of, of what they believe the truth to be. Right. And sometimes, what is the truth? This doesn't mean Patrice was infallible. He wasn't just a comedian that was always right, but he was someone that encouraged intelligent discourse and actively sought out a discussion on any topic so that he could engage in a meaningful and humorous conversation about it. He was a remarkable person who lived truthfully in his own life and who wanted to find the truth in others so that they could seek out the truth in their own lives. That's why he was more than just a comedian and why his legacy will live on. If Patrice was still alive today, I have no doubts in my mind that he would thrive in an era filled with podcasts and talk shows. He would thrive on calling out the numerous movements surrounding free speech and cancel culture, let alone everything else in the world. He would thrive by simply being Patrice and by staying true to himself. Ultimately, that's what I think he would have wanted for all of us. He would have wanted us to embrace confrontation, to embrace righteousness, and embrace honesty. Because that's what Patrice did, and that's something we need to do as well. Rest in peace, the great Patrice O'Neill. I My goal is to somehow have an ability to reach out to whoever wants to listen and I get money for it mm-hmm. somehow. I don't know how to do that, which mm. is which is people who just agree or not agree, they, but they get to hear another side. And and I can I don't have to worry about apologizing every five minutes. I don't have to worry about the police. kicking. I, all I have to do is worry about whether someone agrees with me or not, because I'm, I'm not a frivolous guy. I don't just like say this to get effect. I believe it. It hurts. It well, it hurts of, the, sure. my heart. What kind of job is that? Like what? Nothing. What do you? But do I that? found out like, in 2011. <laughs> when you get a fall, could look you in the eyes. You flow like a feather. And your skin and make me 
cry You're, you're just like an angel In this beautiful world You're so fucking special I wish I was special <clears throat> But I'm a creep I'm a widow What the hell am I doing here When I don't belong here It's okay if it hurts Don't wanna have control I want a perfect body I, I, I want me one of those brand new perfect songs I said I want you to know that Well, I'm not right here You're so fucking special I wish I was special But I'm a creep I'm a little What the hell am I doing here When I don't belong here I, 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 I don't belong here I don't belong here What the fuck am I doing here I don't belong here uh, uh, uh. Whatever makes you happy Whatever you want You're so fucking special oh. I wish I was special Oh man! Oh, oh yeah, of, cor of course. The I bet you that she'd slide those little thong panties off. Too oh, to the motel. she wear a bra? <laughs> yeah, but you know what I might do? To get her the next time I'm at the dress factory. <laughs> I might get her one of those. Uh, those uh, you can take that thing. You can say she can. <laughs> Ha, ha, ha.